Welcome to Consulting Mastery, where we help B2B consultants master the business of consulting. I'm Carrie, And I'm Ahmed. Join us as we explore the art of delivering outstanding client value, earning a higher income, and thriving in today's marketplace. So earlier today, you said something about why it's important to think like an investor. And I thought that would be a great conversation to have. And I'm curious to know what you meant when you said that. So this is, I think, one of the the most powerful philosophies I've taken from uh, from Jay Abraham, and, and I credit him for the idea. He talks about this for entrepreneurs at large, and the, the idea is that entrepreneurs ought to think of themselves as investors because they're investing their time, their expertise, their energy into a business and into a market and into a service and into a client. And instead of thinking about how much money they're going to make from the business or from the client or from the market, uh, they ought to be thinking about how much yield they get from the activity. So entrepreneurs tend to think about revenue, right? How much money am I going to make? How much revenue will I earn? How much profit will I earn? Whereas entrepreneurs think about yield and return, not so much the absolute number, but the relative number. And that's how they compare investments, right? If you're a a savvy investor and somebody comes to you and says, well, I can make you 5% of your money. Well, that's all fine and good. But what if somebody else can make me 10% for the same risk profile? The absolute number matters less than the yield. How do I get the most yield for my money given my risk tolerance? And so Jay's point was that entrepreneurs ought to think the same way about their business. And my point is consultants ought to think that way about consulting businesses where If you're selling an advisory service, a consulting service, a professional service, anything that that stems from your deep subject matter expertise, in that situation, your expertise is your asset. It's your capital. So in the same way an investor invests financial capital into a business or a market or a stock, you're investing your expertise into a business, into a market, into a client, into a service. And there's a lot of decisions that come with that, including what market should I enter? What service should I deliver? How do I structure that service? Which clients should I work with? And so on and so forth. And if you strictly think about those questions from the vantage point of an entrepreneur or a business owner, it's like, will I make money? Will I not make money? And generally, if I'll make money, I'll do it. But when you think about it from an investor's perspective, it's not about will I make money or not. It's about where will I earn the highest return? Where will I earn the most money? Where can I get the highest yield on my input of, in this case, expertise? And I think it's a fundamentally different way of thinking about your business as a consultant. Yeah, I think it's a a really brilliant frame to, to incorporate into your business. And there's two things I'd like to explore. I think one is how does that play out practically? So what does that look like? Because it's one thing to say that's what you're going to do, right? Philosophically, it makes a lot of sense. But let's talk about how the rubber meets meets the road and and what it means day to day. And then the second thing I think would be really useful to explore is how to make that mindset shift because the I'll do it if it makes me money (laughs) is something that just exists, right? When people, especially when people are launching their business, when they maybe haven't really thought it through. And so it could also be helpful to, to talk through how people can get from one side of that thought process to the other. But let's start with what changes this framework and this way of thinking um, can make in a day-to-day for an entrepreneur. So I think you can apply this at three different levels. Market, offer, client. And it has implications at every level. So starting with market, what market to pursue? What market to target? What market to enter? Let's say you're a consultant and you've worked in a lot of different markets, but your best case studies are, for example, in financial services. Well, all things considered, if if we assume everything else is the same, which it rarely is, but for the sake of the example, if everything else is the same, you've got the same level of expertise in every market, you've got um, connections in every market, you've got Uh, the ability to deliver in every market and the margins are the same and the potential pricing of your services is the same. If all that's the same, but you have stronger case studies and financial services, 
you're probably going to earn more money in that market because you have more proof. So that's a market now that potentially has a higher yield. Another way to look at it is, as another example, is if there's a market that has deeper pockets, that has more access to financial resources to pay for your services, well, your pricing can probably be more generous in those markets, and they'll probably buy faster. So from a market perspective, the question is, you know, I have an asset via my expertise. That asset can be invested in different markets, market segments, verticals, if you will. Where does it go the furthest? That's the first question. Yeah, and I think I will add to that, that what you're really kind of getting to is intentionality, right? Really making a smart choice. And when you've thought through where you're going to get your highest yield, it allows you to measure that against all of the other things that you talked about, right? Including who do I want to work with? And like any return that you're paying attention to, right? It's always, it's never usually just about the actual amount of money that you are earning. It's how you're earning it. It's, you know, all the other things that come with it. And so what I think is really interesting about this is it doesn't necessarily point to one correct solution, but what it does do is make you think through it in a way that is um, more well-rounded. Yeah, it was a great point. So think about yield in the broader sense, right? Is yield strictly financial return? Well, if you're an investor that's arm's length investing money in capital and you're not involved in the day-to-day -day of the business, then it probably is strictly return, assuming it falls within the, the boundaries of what you might consider ethical uh, for yourself, right? In terms of where you want to invest your money. But you running the business, yeah, different story. It's not just about the money. It's about the experience. It's about the energy, so, you know, we advise clients on this all the time. People say, well, I have a lot of experience in this market, but I hate this market. <laughs> right? The answer is always, well, probably shouldn't go there because if you hate it, it's going to feel like a drag. You're not going to have a lot of optimism and drive to pursue that market. You're not going to work very hard because you intrinsically don't enjoy working in that market or with those people. So... I absolutely would think about yield in the broader sense of, sure, there's the financial yield. There's also the energy yield. There's the satisfaction yield. There's how you feel about going to work and working with clients and doing the work in your business, given the market that you serve. That's absolutely uh, part of this process. Yeah, and it, it really requires sitting down and being honest with yourself. And we walk people through, you know, a, a specific way of doing this that kind of helps provide some framing. But, you know, the reality is that we've also watched a lot of people start down a path, right? Because it feels like it's the one that's either the most fun, and then they find out that it isn't going to get them the financial yield, or they go down the path of the thing that seems the easiest when it comes to earning money and then realize that it doesn't meet those other expectations. So this notion of yield across the board, I think is a really, really important one. And, and often you don't know until you jump in, right? Yes. And so this is the other thing that that folks should keep in mind is, uh, you know, we're not saying you make a decision to pursue a market and that's it forever and you've got to commit to it and there's no going back. No, there's testing involved here, right? You do a deal or two in a given market, test the waters, see how it feels, see how the client engages, see the results of your of your work, and then you make decisions based on that. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to test here to come to some reasonable conclusions. Yeah, absolutely. And just make sure that you're lining up the hard data with what's happening in your gut, because both of those things are equally important, especially if you are the person who is, you know, both marketing or, all, you know, doing all of marketing, selling and delivery. The second level here is one that we see a lot among clients, and that is, where do you earn the highest yield from a service perspective? from an offer perspective, from a delivery perspective, right? So the classic management consultant will come in and say, here's the menu, <laughs> right? We can do A, we can do B, we can do C, and we can do X, Y, and Z. And they're perfectly content offering a very wide variety of services to a small number of clients. The problem with that approach is if you look at what they're earning on each service, again, broadly speaking, both in terms of rate, yield, profit, satisfaction, energy, results. That's the other thing too, results, right? Which offers, which services generate better results and better case studies, they're likely not all equal. And then what you realize is when you, when you make that analysis, what you realize is that there are certain offers or services that just deliver a higher yield across the board. 
and there are ones that underperform. And so the other way to apply this, the other the second level, if you will, is once you know what your target market is, who you're going after, right? You, you've applied the investor level thinking uh, to your choice of market client clarity, as we call it. The second level is what do we deliver? What problem do we solve? And therefore, what offer do we deliver? Because not all problems are created equal. And there are some client problems that are more expensive, right? That command higher fees and that you are better able and equipped to solve for given your expertise. Yeah, absolutely. And also recognizing there's an evolution, right? And when you're thinking about, as an example, you know, a lot of consultants are walking into this trying to figure out what's the most efficient way, right? The most effective way to deliver results. What's the most effective way to get, you know, my clients where they need to be. Um, you know, there, there's also some thinking around what the evolution of that will look like because we talk a lot about narrowing the offer and narrowing the focus and being clear. One of the reasons for that is you can get to a place where your delivery is much more effective because you're now not reinventing the wheel or, you know, researching or completely creating a different, um, you know, a different path, a different results mechanism every time you solve a problem. And so again, you may start by testing a few things, but you know the benefit is almost always in narrowing that down. And in, in, in short, the upside of narrowing your focus when it comes to service delivery and offer is the more times you solve the same problem, the, the more effective you get at solving that problem. So your results get better just through practice and repetition. You're able to solve the problem, so that, therefore case studies right? Results, case studies. You're able to solve the problem faster through repetition. Just do it over and over and over again. You develop efficiencies. So, so margin goes up just through more efficient and streamlined service delivery. And your price point goes up because better results equals a higher price point. So you got a lower cost base through more efficient delivery. You've got a higher price point because of your undeniable track record of case studies and results, higher gross margin, better business. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone's going to argue with any one of those things. We all I want them not. all, right? So and we the, talked about why we want to think like an investor. We talked about what it means to your business. I would love to have a, a quick conversation here about how to get into that frame of mind because I think you know, almost everyone we talk to agrees with this intellectually, but what we see is them making decisions that don't align, right? When they're not thinking like an investor. So if you think about the folks that, you know, we worked with, um, or even us, what do you see as the cleanest and most effective way to get from uh, thinking like the consultant, like the business owner to thinking like an investor? So I want to give you one more layer here because I think it's important to mention, and then let's let's jump into that question. The, the third layer to apply this to is the client level. And that's really important to you because you might have the right selection of market, target market, market segment. You might have the right service offering. You're solving the right problem. And you may have a client that comes along that is squarely within your target market, has the problem that you solve that you should not work with. Why? It's the intangibles. It's the client's attitude. It's the company culture. It's the internal dynamics inside the organization. It's the buy-in from leadership. It's all these intangibles that you can't demographically qualify it out for. But when you start talking to the prospect and you hear them describe their problem and what they want to achieve, it's these intangibles that may disqualify a client. And we see people make mistakes here all the time is the client demographically checks all the boxes, right? Client, right organization, right problem, we can solve it. But practically, it's going to be tough to get it done inside their organization with their organization. And that's an important disqualifier because if you've got a pipeline full of clients who you can serve, which certainly our clients do, that's why they work with us, then you don't want to take on a bad fit client who you can't get results for because of something internal to them when the opportunity cost of doing so is working with a great fit client you can get great results for because the intangibles are aligned with performance. So I'm going to flip the last question back to you. What do you think? I mean, we've 
we've what graduated 800 clients in four years and instilled this thinking into them. What's preventing them from making that leap from consultant? Uh, and and that to be more precise about that thinking, consultants think of themselves as a pair of hands. Often, this is the mistake. I'm the doer. I'm the person that comes in and does the work and gets a result. What's preventing people from making that leap from consultant, doer, pair of hands type thinking to investor thinking? Yeah, I would say, I mean, there's two things. One, they're thinking about themselves as a pair of hands. But I think the other thing that often really, really contributes to this is just the scarcity mindset, right? The notion that I need to take the work, I need to do the thing, I need to, you know, take what comes to me versus making a decision about where I want to be. And, you know, quite frankly, some of that just takes some time and experience and successes and, you know, getting to a place where your confidence builds. And so, you know, there are, there are certainly certainly some things that we do working with clients to, to help short circuit that so that they don't have to have brought in successfully served 30 clients of their own before they start to feel like they can really go out there and, and stake their claim. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is really about recognizing, uh, you know, what it is that they take out into the world and understanding that people are, are your prospects are going to bring you into their business because of the problem you can solve, right? Because of the difference that they are going to, you know, the different world they're going to be living in after they work with you than they do prior to you joining uh, you know, joining them in, in solving this problem. And when we can, you know, shift people into that place where they're really clear about the problem they're solving, as opposed to just walking in and taking on tasks or projects or, you know, bits and pieces of, of another person's organization, that's really where the difference lands. So a lot of this happens really in the work that we do, again, going back to defining the, the problem and the offer, and just ensuring that when consultants are talking about who they're working with, when they're, con when they're talking about what the problem is that they solve, when they're talking about how they solve it, they're truly, truly focused on delivering the solution as opposed to delivering all the steps that are going to get them there. Yeah, it's interesting because I find that people's confidence wanes the broader their focus. 100%. So it, it, it's really hard to be uh, to have bulletproof confidence in your ability to deliver when you target every market on the planet and you offer every service under the sun. But when we narrow, we say, well, what if it was just you know financial services and optimizing their CRM? Obviously, arbitrary examples, and you've got a track record of doing so. Your confidence is going to be sky high. And for you, the listener, I think the question is: think about like right now. Think about your best case study. Think about the best client you ever worked with. They were a perfect fit. They got fantastic results. It was a great case study. Hopefully you were paid well for it. You enjoyed the work. What if you built the business around only doing deals just like that? How much confidence would you have as opposed to the broader focus you likely have now? I think that's a really important point. The second thing I would add is uh, experts tend to undervalue their expertise. You know, it's easier for an investor, right? Because if I got a million dollars to invest, that it's objectively a million dollars, right? No one's going to argue, well, your money is actually worth half that. No, it's it's a million dollars. Like we can measure that. We can quantify my capital. You need 10 million. I have a million. That is 10%. It's very clear and cut and dry. Expertise is intangible, obviously. Money is tangible. Expertise is intangible. And so what happens is experts have the curse of knowledge, <laughs> And the curse of knowledge basically means that you don't know what it's like to not know what you know. So we see this every single day in our program as clients come in, they go, well, I don't know. There's nothing really distinct about what I do. There's nothing unique about it. I do what everyone else does in the market. Uh, why is this special? Why? How can I charge a premium? Why would clients pay me more than they pay others? And they just fundamentally don't understand because it's hard, right? Because you know it's hard to read the label on the jar when you're inside the jar, and it's hard to see the picture when you're in, when you're in the picture. Uh, they just don't have the 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 distance or the objectivity to look at what they do, or look at their offer, find the distinction in it, and conclude that this is in fact unique and distinct, and therefore expensive. 
So let's talk about a bit of a mental shortcut because you were talking about case studies. And I think often when we talk about case studies, we're talking about them as assets that we take out into the market, right? I have a case study because I want to be able to tell my prospects that this is the thing that I've done. I would argue that those case studies are often more important for you. So capturing your case studies, you know, writing them down, getting super, super clear about what was the benefit that came out of that engagement, that is a thing that is going to help you understand what the true value of what it is that you did is to the people who, you know, were able to take advantage of it. And so if that's not something that you've done, it needs to happen right away. You know, get super clear. And you'll also start to notice and you'll see this, the themes. You'll understand, you know, how you can narrow down. You'll understand which clients got the best results. All of those things will start to come out of this exercise. So really consider that case studies are as, you know, are as of much value for yourself, probably more than they are for folks that you're aiming to sell to. Because if you don't believe it, they won't believe it. So you got to you got to believe your own hype, drink your own Kool Aid, so to speak. So you know this in the early days of ninety day pipeline. Ninety day pipeline is our flagship program. In the early days, Carrie, you're one of the I don't know first few clients, probably top ten, top fifteen, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Top ten in always, right? Yeah, in every, in every way possible. Yes. Um, I had a list. It was a really simple Google Doc of things clients said. And it was just, we were on a call and somebody said, wow, this is amazing. I couldn't have done it without you. That's going in the document. I love the new positioning or the message that we came up with. I'm so excited about this. It's going into the document. Uh, And, you know, in addition to, I closed the deal for 100K, it's going in the document. The tangible stuff, the intangible stuff, all the positive feedback that I received in the early days from the delivery of the program, all that stuff went into a document for my eyes only. Yes, we had testimonials for the public. But that was secondary to me bolstering my own belief in what I was doing. And that was necessary to enable growth and scale. Well, and you talk about it like it's in the past, but it's not. I mean, we still collect those things. And it's not in your private document. It's now shared with our organization. Um, because certainly as we grow, and you know, for folks who are listening who have more than one or two people in the organization, it then becomes important to be able to communicate that across the board. So yeah, you started that however many years ago that was, and now it is you know an integral part of what it is that we do for good reason. Because everyone on the team's got to be sold in the vision and the impact that we're having on clients. So yeah, it was me. It was simple. <laughs> it was simpler days. It was a single Google Doc I had to convince myself, right? And now we need to convince the 20 some odd people that, that work for the team. So... But you're right, it's the same exercise. It's selling ourselves on ourselves. That's the big sale. If we sell ourselves on ourselves, you know, selling to clients and conveying that to clients becomes a, a fairly straightforward second step or consequence. You got it. So thinking like an investor, anything else to add before we wrap it up? No, I think the last thing maybe is you may need to earn the right to think this way. And so I think practically, if you're starting out and you're just coming out of a corporate job and you need to just pay the bills, then get some gigs, do some work. Absolutely. Like get into business and become cash flow positive and pay your bills. And at that point, I think being more strategic and thinking like an investor becomes more important. Not to say that it's not important in the beginning, but this is easier to do when your needs are taken care of. So keep that in mind. That's interesting. Can I argue with you now? Yeah, of course you can. As we close up, time to start an argument. I would actually say you want to start thinking that way right from the beginning. But what you're actually doing at the front end when you don't have that experience and everything behind you is making a decision as an investor to do the work, to gather information and to build your war chest, right? Like you're still thinking from the perspective of an investor building a healthy business but you are knowing that you're going to go through a few steps before you can really do this, um, you know, this, this very specific thinking around yield that we've been talking about. Well, and let's be clear, like what enables this thinking is opportunity. So if nobody knows who you are and you have no pipeline and you have no leads, you have no opportunity and you need to, you know, sign a deal tomorrow, that's tough, (laughs) you know, like, that's it's going to be really hard to think like an investor, think strategically at any level. 
But if you do the work in addition to, you know, taking deals where you can get them and, and, and generating cash flow, if you do the work of actually creating opportunity, not because you need it today, but because you'll need it in three, six, nine, 12 months from now, if you do that work and what we, you know, building pipeline, that's what we help clients with 90 daypipelinecom If you do that work now, you give yourself the opportunity to make strategic decisions without worrying about keeping the lights on because you have lots of opportunity to choose from. 